So, church, moving on to our sermon series back in Galatians. We're in chapter 3. Today we'll be looking at verses 23 to 29. Let us bow our heads and pray before we go to the, the word. Father, we praise you once again, and we thank you so much, Lord, that we can come before you, that we can worship you freely. And Lord, I pray now that you would humble our hearts, Lord, that you would turn off the noise of this world and its many distractions. Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate your word for us, give us understanding, give us discernment as we go to the word. May it forever change us. Lord, I ask that you would empty me of myself. No one needs to hear my words. Lord, every week, every day, we need your word. So be with us now. May you be honored. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 to 29. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Our sermon title today is Captive or Free. Captive or Free. We will see how all of us are either captive or we are free. Captive under the law or free in Christ. We will see how the law is like that of a prison, but also like that of a guardian. And how in Christ we are not only free, but share in some incredible blessings that Paul lays out for us in our text. Let us look first at the law. Our first point today is captive under the law. Verse 23, now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Now before faith comes, we are all, as Paul explains, held captive under the law and imprisoned. We know faith has always been the only way of salvation by God's grace. Abraham prophetically looking forward to the promised Messiah and for those after the cross historically looking back in faith. Paul's point here is that before one comes to the point of faith and revealing salvation in Christ alone, they are held in a prison under the law, as we are all without an excuse. Romans 1, 18 to 21, Paul lays this out for us. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, all of us have God's law imprinted on our hearts, and therefore even our conscience bears witness to this truth imprisoning us. Romans 2, 14 to 15, Paul continues, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. Even without having a written law, we are hardwired to know it within our conscience. So either through the written law or of scripture or inward law of conscience, until one comes to a place of acknowledging their basic sinfulness and inability to fully and perfectly fulfill the demands of God's law, they will not come to a place of brokenness and repentance seeking salvation. 
It is not until one is confronted with the crushing weight, reality and despair of their own sinfulness that they will come in humble faith to Christ and be filled with his righteousness. How sad it is to see some so desperately wanting salvation but are unwilling to recognize and repent of their sin. They are completely deceived. Church, salvation is to be taken out of sin. That's what salvation is. It's to be taken out of sin, delivered from it. A person cannot want to continue in sin and at the same time want to be free from it. One cannot want the new life in Christ, clothed in righteousness, without putting off and renouncing the old life of sin, rooted in selfishness and pride. And so what does this look like? Well, Scripture tells us, James 4, 7 through 10, James says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. This is what it looks like to mourn and be broken over sin. Be wretched, mourn, weep over your sin. The joy in sin turns to gloom once you see it for what it is. Coming to a place of humility before God, undone at the realization of the offense before a holy God. Remember, church, from last week, the law is like that of a mirror, revealing and convicting us of sin, giving sight to it. Paul wrote that I would not have come to know sin except through the law, declaring I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died because he couldn't keep it. None of us can, like that of someone in prison on death row. Some of you are familiar with the Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan writes, As I walked through the wilderness of this world, I lighted on a certain place where was a den and laid me down in that place to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed, and behold, I saw a man clothed with rags standing in a certain place with his face from his own house, a book in his hand, and a great burden upon his back. I looked and saw him open the book and read therein, and as he read, he wept and trembled, and not being able longer, not being able longer to contain, he broke out with a lamentable cry, saying, What shall I do? A short while later, the man encountered evangelist, who asked, Wherefore doest thou cry? Pilgrim answered, Sir, I perceive by the book in my hand that I am condemned to die, and after that to come to judgment. Evangelist then pointed the pilgrim toward a gate in the distance into a light beyond it and a hill. With that great burden on his back and the book in his hand, pilgrim starting off toward the hill, crying out, Life, life, eternal life. See, the burden on the pilgrim's back was a sin. The book in his hand was the Bible, and the hill toward which he journeyed was Calvary, the cross of Christ. It was in reading God's word that he learned God's law condemned him to death and hell because of his sin. And it was that knowledge of sin and judgment that drove him to the cross of Christ, where the penalty for his sin was paid in full and complete forgiveness offered. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody. Amen. This should be the reality for those who realize the imprisonment of the law. As the pilgrim was broken and humbled with the weight of his sin, in the coming judgment, saving grace is then extended as a gift from God. As one is overwhelmed at their inability to do anything to earn God's righteousness. As God resists the proud but gives grace to who? The humble. The humble. Before his conversion, Paul was of the religious elite. A Pharisee proud and committed to his Jewish lineage and the law and religious works, as he says in Philippians 3, 5 to 6, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law. Paul says he was blameless. 
soaked in the pride of religious elitism, bound and imprisoned by it. However, once confronted with the way of salvation by God's grace through faith, listen to Paul in verses 7 through 9. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Apart from faith, the law reveals the weight and punishment of sin and chains us to it. Paul says before death, before faith comes, comes all are held captive under the law, held in like that of a prison, on death row for the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Those who live by the law and attempt to keep it even to the best of their ability, church, as we've been learning the last few weeks, are held captive under the law like that of a prison. Secondly, Paul shows us that the law is like that of a guardian. In verse 24, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. The word guardian Paul uses in the Greek is paedagogos. Now, the paedagogos was typically a slave employed by Greek or Roman families to care for their young boys on behalf of their parents. They would take them to and from school, make sure their studies were complete, and would train them in obedience. They were strict. Strict disciplinaries, scolding and whipping as they felt necessary. Paul uses the example of the pedagogos when writing to the Corinthians, who at times behaved like spoiled children. 1 Corinthians 4.15, for you, for though you have countless guides, pedagogos, in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Paul being their spiritual father, as it was he that brought the gospel to them. The Patagagos was not a permanent fixture in the life of the young boys guarded. At the age of 18, they would come out from under their tutors, probably in celebration, to be away from them, I bet. Screaming freedom or something like that, as they entered adulthood. In most cases, there would always remain a relationship between the two, though. Upon having completed their care and assignment and guiding the child, there would be no more authority or control over the children. And likewise, as the child, now a young man, he would have no more responsibility to be under their guardian's direction or instruction. And this is Paul's point regarding the law. The law was God's appointed pedagogos, our guardian to lead men to Christ in order that we might be justified by faith. You see, the Judaizers Paul is so concerned with in the book of Galatians, Judaizers wanted their hearers to go back to Moses, to be their permanent pedagogue. And you see, that wasn't far enough. In fact, what they really needed to do was go back to Abraham where the promise of justification by faith was given. So we studied a couple weeks ago in Genesis 15, 6. See, the law came hundreds of years later, and we know it did not in any way annul God's promise of salvation by grace through faith. The law was simply given to reveal sin and prepare the way for Christ to come, fulfilling the promise. Martin Luther says this, the law does not lead us to another lawgiver requiring good works, but to Christ, our justifier and savior, so that we might be justified by faith in him and not by works. But when we feel the force of the law, we do not understand or believe this. That is why we say, I have lived wickedly, for I have transgressed all God's commandments, and therefore I am guilty of eternal death. If God would prolong my life for a few years, or at least a few months, 
I would amend my life and live a holy life from now on. This is an abuse of the proper function of the law. Church, we've got to remember this, and to Luther's point, write it down. The law is a tutor, not a savior. A mirror, not a cleanser. Captive or free, captive under the law. We see here in these verses that before faith comes, before faith in Christ, the law holds us captive and bound like that of a prison. Paul also shows us that its purpose was that of a guide or guardian leading us to Christ. And this brings us to our second point today, the incredible reality for those who believe we are free in Christ. Free in Christ. Look at verse 25. For now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. You see, the Judaizers refused to give up the ceremonial law even after making a profession of faith in Christ. That weight of the law was more than they could bear. So they added trust in Christ to works of the law. And because of this and their bondage to the law, they could not receive the freedom of faith. They insisted on staying under the guardian and never came under the care of the Savior. It's heartbreaking. Not seeing that the law was never the means of salvation, but to show men their sin and to lead them to the Savior. The burden from the law's moral demands left men just consumed with guilt and all the external ceremonies, circumcision, offerings, the washings, the Sabbaths, the feasts, and on and on we go, were symbolic of the need to be cleansed from that guilt. Paul says, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under the law as a guardian. Now out from under the law's symbolism, bondage, and discipline, the law's purpose has been fulfilled no longer under law, but under grace. Romans 6.14, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. That is not to say God's moral standards change. Not in the least. No, we see God's standard remain, but the power in which we are able to walk in obedience is completely enabled by the Holy Spirit working in us for good works, as we see in Ephesians 2.10. And now in the remaining three verses, Paul shows us three aspects of the freedom that comes through our faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 26, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Remember, church, as we said last week, anytime you see four at the beginning of a paragraph, it means explanation is coming. Paul here now begins to share and explain what the coming of faith did for us and how it freed us from the guiding function of the law. Firstly, we are made sons, we are made daughters. We are children of God through faith. Although God is the father of all men and women, creatively speaking, all creation, as he made all things, it is unbiblical and unfounded in the scriptures that God is the father of all men, redemptively speaking. God's only true spiritual children are those who through faith in Christ Jesus grow in the fullness of Christ, becoming spiritual sons of God. Paul explains, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God. And the all there, that all speaks of every believer of every race. The reality within God's word for those outside of faith in Christ is that apart from saving faith in Jesus Christ, all human beings are enemies of God. Romans 5.10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Enemies of God, but also children of wrath. Ephesians 2, 3. Among whom, all, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, 
like the rest of mankind. Just like that of the self-righteous Pharisees Jesus confronted in Jerusalem, every unbeliever is a child of the devil. John 8, 44. And John explains in 1 John 3, 8 and verse 10, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. In verse 10, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. It is only those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ who can rightly say they are spiritual children of God the Father. It is only Jesus that brings the believer into sonship with God the Father. John 1, 12, but to all who did receive him, that is Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Paul writes later in Galatians 4, 6, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Romans 8, 16, Paul says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Do you see that, loved ones? The first thing God does for those who will believe is give him himself in the form of the indwelling spirit of God. The spirit then assures us that we belong to the Father. Crying out, Abba, Aramaic, meaning daddy or papa. A warm term of endearment young children used for their fathers then we can come to God our Father in such a way. What a gift. It is only through Jesus that we have the privilege of coming to the Father. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Paul continues in verse 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ baptized into Christ. Though water baptism is the outward act of public confession of one's faith in Christ Jesus, that is not the baptism Paul is speaking of here. The Bible nowhere teaches salvation by physical water baptism. And especially not here, as we have studied Galatians. The central message as we have studied is salvation by faith alone. Faith alone. As Paul equates this baptism with putting on Christ or being clothed with him, being baptized here cannot refer to any water ceremony, but actually speaks to spiritual identification with Christ and immersion into the life of Christ. Paul explains this in depth in his letter to the Romans in chapter 6. This is truly a great mystery that we cannot fully fathom. But those of us who have placed our trust in Christ Jesus, becoming children of God, have in a supernatural way been crucified, buried, and resurrected with our Savior, baptized into Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, that he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. We can rejoice. We can rejoice in that. That means as the Father looks at us, the sinful believer, he sees Jesus, his sinless Son. As children of God and with the indwelling Spirit working in us, we should bring honor to him, bring honor to his name by the way in which we live. Having put on Christ, clothed with him, our lives should reflect that of our Savior. Philippians 2.15, Paul says that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. That is how we should be living. We should be beacons of light for the world to see Christ in us. Having been crucified with Christ, no longer I that live, but Christ living in me. In the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith. 
And the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Galatians 2.20. You see, church, every day we must live this reality. Crucifying our flesh, praying to God to strengthen and equip us to seek his will and not our own. We put on Christ for all to see. Through faith in Jesus, loved ones, we have been so blessed to be called children of God. What a gift. What a gift. Secondly, we see that we are one. We are one with fellow believers. Paul says there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all one in Christ with our fellow believers. And you know, Paul here speaks directly into the well-defined distinctions in the time of his, his society, which were hard-lined divisions and separation between people. In this day, particularly namely Jews, free men, and males in general, were considered better. They had more value and were more significant than anyone and everyone else. And so we are crystal clear. The gospel destroys this kind of prideful thinking. The beauty of the gospel one of the three gifts we see Paul outline for us here, for those in Christ, is that when a believer comes, becomes one with Christ, they also become one with every other believer. There are zero distinctions among those who belong to Christ, one with one another, in Christ. In spiritual matters, there is to be made no racial, social, or sexual discrimination. Neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, no male and female. Now, obviously, there are Jews and there are Greeks and there, there are those who are slaves and there are those of us who are free. Paul's not saying there is not racial, there is not social and sexual differences among people. That's not what he's saying. Paul is speaking of spiritual maps spiritual differences. When we stand before the Lord, our spiritual value, privilege, and worthiness, that is what he's speaking to. Now, prejudice based on race, social status, sex, or any other difference has absolutely no place in the life of a Christian or among the fellowship of Christ church. Zero. In Christ, we are one standing as equals, without exception. Romans 10, 12, Paul says, For there is no distinction, distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. I don't need to remind us of our current climate and the polarizing effects we are seeing on the basis of race, social justice, and sex, and gender, and on and on and on I could go. It is everywhere and being plastered across every platform imaginable. I just want to warn all of you as fellow Christians, we do not and cannot get caught up in the world's secular ways and terminology of such matters. We know the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That he requires us to do justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. The wickedness we see and the division we see is the result of unrepentant hearts and people who hate God. Worldly, man-made policies and strategies are not going to bring unity or peace. They're not going to do what only God can do. And that is to, spiritually speaking, do a heart transplant, taking a heart of stone and giving someone a heart of flesh. Only God takes those dead in transgression and brings them to life found only in Christ. We cannot get caught up in the world's ways. We bring the gospel. We love people. We show grace and mercy. And we pray God would draw many to himself and save them. Let's break this down a little bit further, church. There is no place for racial prejudice. There is neither Jew nor Greek. 
There is no place for racial partiality. None whatsoever. There is no justification for biblical. Romans 2.11 says, There is no respect of persons with God. And what does that mean? Meaning God does not favor one person over another. If you set yourself up partially to races over other races, you set yourself above God. That is true in terms, in terms of your relationships on any level, but also in terms of your employment. Look at Ephesians 6, 9. Paul says, Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. God has no favorites. In Acts 13, 1, we find the pastors of the church in Antioch. Five of them are listed. One of them, Simeon, is mentioned. Regarding Simeon, he was also called Niger, indicating the possibility that he himself was black and one of the five pastors there. We can also look to Timothy. Timothy was the child of a mixed marriage. He was both Jew and he was Greek. God has no favorites, no place for racial prejudice. Secondly, there is no distinction in social status. There is neither slave nor free. There are no ranks in the body of Christ. None at all. And James gets to the heart of this matter in James 2, 1 through 8. My brother, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? James says, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. There it is. It doesn't matter if a fellow brother or sister comes and comes in here dirty with dirty clothes, with holes in their shoes and not a penny to their name. We embrace them. We extend them grace, mercy. We are one with them. If you are a social climber and you do more for the wealthy and less for the poor, you have in your actions shown favoritism based on social rank. In so doing, you commit sin. Thirdly, there is no sexual distinction. There is neither male nor female. Christianity elevated women to a place they had never known in the ancient world. Spiritually, they are equals. In God's pattern and design for the church and for the home, the man is to lead, and the woman is to be submissive as he submits to Christ. But from the spiritual dimension, they are equal in Christ, recipients of all spiritual blessings in the heavens. Don't let the wickedness of the world, feminism, male chauvinism, both evil, by the way, don't let them twist God's word in perfect design. Men and women are equal in value, but God has given each a specific role in his design for church and home to bring himself honor and glory. Loved ones, we're all one person in Christ. The benefits of being in Christ are being sons of God and one with each other. Through faith in Jesus, loved ones, we have been so blessed to be called children of God. Secondly, in Christ, we are one with our fellow believers. One body equals in Christ. And lastly, today, church, we are heirs. Heirs according to the promise. Verse 29, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Heirs according to promise. If you are Christ, if you belong to him, 
and the spiritual promise of eternal salvation and blessing given to Abraham also belongs to you. All of us heirs according to that promise which is fulfilled in Christ. This is not speaking to the promises given to Abraham regarding land, as we saw in Genesis 12, 13, and also in 17, but speaks to the spiritual blessing that comes to all who are justified by faith, as Abraham was in Genesis 15, 6. And will inherit the spiritual promises given to Abraham. As we covered a few weeks back, not all of Abraham's physical descendants, all his physical seeds, will receive these promises by coming to God by faith. And that faith being counted as righteousness, just as Abraham did, and so becoming his spiritual offspring. Now, church, I know I've gone long today. But church, I really need you to lean in here. Do you know what it is to be heirs according to the promise? An heir is a person legally entitled to the property or rank of another on that person's death. That means, church, we are, according to God's word, by grace through faith, and in alignment with God's promise, heirs and receive Christ's inheritance. We receive Jesus' inheritance to those of us who are children of God. Romans 8, 17, Paul says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Fellow heirs with Christ, church. Really got to get a handle on that. The inheritance of Jesus belongs to all of us in him. That are positionally sanctified. Meaning we were bought and we are sealed. Sealed with him. Acts 20, 32. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Church, again, look at Titus 3, 7. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Those who are children of God are also sealed with the promise of the Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And church, I close with this. In Christ, loved ones, you are children of God. You are free, and the eternal glory that awaits us is beyond anything we can truly comprehend. But listen to this. I may encourage you now and always. Revelation 21, 3 to 4 and verse 7. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Listen, church. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Look at verse 7. The one who conquers that is the one victorious, the one who overcomes, will have, will inherit this heritage. That is the blessings. And look, church, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. John Stott, theologian, summarizes our passage today like this. We cannot come to Christ to be justified until we have first been to Moses to be condemned. But once we have gone to Moses and acknowledged our sin, guilt, and condemnation, we must not stay there. We must let Moses send us to Christ. Great word. The law holds us captive as prisoners, like a guardian, but it's unable to save us. Pointing us to Calvary, to the cross, and through faith in Christ, we are free. Children of God, one body, heirs. Christ.